Hello everyone and welcome to Engine Selection and Realism Overhaul. If you have ever contemplated trying out Realism Overhaul, you might have been daunted by the sheer selection of engines. And indeed, there are quite a lot of them. I've got a Saturn 1B rocket with an array of engines placed on it. And they are arranged in a very logical way. Small engines on top, increasing thrust, and then the bigger ones on the bottom. And then down the center line are the sort of important engines, the, the go-to engines, if you will. And then other possible options on the side that you might consider. Now, this is quite a lot to handle. And of course, your install might not have all of the engines that I have here. This install is the one I use for rocket profiles and mission profiles. So it actually has the capability of building any rocket that actually existed. So uh, I have lots of engines. I have lots of engines of all sorts, uh, but we don't need to cover all of them. I'm not gonna be covering SRBs or nukes or uh, high tech stuff that is beyond what we have right now. These are just regular chemical engines, no ion engines or anything like that either. And uh, I'm not gonna be co covering RCS thrusters for obvious reasons, but um, yeah. There's still quite a lot, and I want to categorize them a bit. And But first, the thing you probably want to know is which engine packs should you get? I mean, there are all sorts of mods with lots of engines. Well, it's actually pretty simple. There's like one base engine pack you want to get for anything you want to do. And if what you want to do is recreate Mercury, Gemini, or Apollo, you need to get FASA. And uh, on the Realism Overhaul GitHub, there's a good version of FASA that you can use. And if you just want engines and nothing else, and you just want a reasonable selection of engines and you're gonna be playing in sandbox, then the pack you want is real engines. It's just called real engines pack. And um, if you want like uh, all the parts, not just the engines, but you want like good tanks, you want crew capsules, you want lander capsules, um, you want all that business, you want to be able to recolor your tanks, then you get SSTU Labs, it'll give you enough engines. You don't need SSTU Labs and FASA, or you don't need SSTU Labs and uh, Real Engine Pack, unless you want specific engines from each, because uh, they do have slightly different sets of engines. But if you just want to create good rockets in Sandbox Realism Overhaul, then you just need one of those. Uh, but... Yeah, and then uh, with uh, Real Engine Pack, you can use procedural parts to get your tanks. If you're doing Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, FASA has your tanks. With If you want to use SSDU, it'll give you your tanks. So that is how it works. The Saturn one you see here is from FASA, of course. And yeah, but there are a lot of other little engine packs all over the place. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the engines that we have here. Uh, broadly speaking, there are four types of fuels. Uh, you know, with real fuels, you get all sorts of fuels and you get, I mean, it's very complicated if you're going from liquid fuel and oxidizer to all these real fuels, but really there are only four types. There's solid fuels and they're easy enough to see. Uh, they're either called solid or HTPB or P-ban or something like that, but there's only gonna be one there. It's uh, solid fuels or monopropellants as far as realism overall is concerned as far as I can tell. Uh, so solids I'm gonna set aside and you'll recognize solid boosters pretty easily most of the time. And uh, their efficiency is lower than for the liquid fuel engines. So they're the lowest efficiency. And if you built an entire rocket out of solid rocket motors, what I would estimate as the payload capacity to orbit is about 2% of the rocket's launch weight. So the way you'd work backwards is, you, let's say you wanted to launch 10 tons. You take 10 tons divided by 0.02, and then you'd get the expected weight of the rocket, and that will inform you about what kind of engines you need. So if you're going for 10 tons, well, you would take 10 tons divided by 0.02 for a pure solid rocket uh, launcher, and you get 500 tons for the launch mass, so you know you need about a 5,000 kilonewton engine at the bottom, or in this case, a solid rocket booster with 5,000 kilonewtons, and then you can make your selection from there. Uh, the next step up from SRBs are two classes. There's the kerosene oxygen and then the hypergolic fuels. Uh, so easy to find a kerosene engine, uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen. That's one of these. 
And in fact, this is the engine that's at the bottom of the Saturn 1B right now. And the hypergolic fuels come in a lot of different flavors, but they, they sort of look similar in that there's, the oxidizer is NTO or nitric acid or IRFNA. Uh, it's inhibited red fuming nitric acid or it's uh, MON3. All of these are actually variants of, they're sort of stemming out of nitric acid. So NTO is probably the most common one, and you'll see it a lot on Soviet engines. And uh, so there is a Soviet engine pack, but largely that's been subsumed by a uh, real engine pack. And uh, so this is just the kerosene oxygen, but if I find the RD-253, uh, this is UDMH and NTO, so this is a hypergolic engine. And hypergolic engines, you'll see 300 to 340 seconds ISP in vacuum, and that's about the same range for kerosene and oxygen as well. The difference is that UDMH and N204 and other hypergolics are more storable, and they are storable, and uh, also they take up a little bit less space. You get smaller tanks out of them than you do with uh, kerosene and oxygen. So that's sometimes a benefit. And uh, this engine is right here uh, in our scheme of things. But yeah, uh, that is that those two classes are right there. And then there's the final class, which, well, that, that I may, I'm leaving out methane and oxygen, like with the Raptor engine. That's because they're not in service yet. But uh, methane and oxygen would fit in the middle. And then the Hydrolox, hydrogen and oxygen, is the last class. Hydrogen and oxygen has the best ISP. Uh, more than 400 generally, but the drawback is that hydrogen is not very dense, so you need really big tanks. So you have to weigh that in the balance. They also tend to be very expensive engines. But with the hypergolics and with kerosene and oxygen, you can get about 3%. That's what you would estimate. And then hydrolox, you can get 4% of your launch mass to orbit. That's what you would estimate. That doesn't mean that's the limit. You can get 5% or even a little bit more than 5% if you do it right, but, um, and it just occurs to me that I missed one engine here, I missed the M1, but um, yeah, uh, that's your initial estimate. So for the Saturn 1B, it was aiming to get 20 tons to orbit, and if you take 20 tons, divide by 0 0.03 for 3% uh, payload capacity to orbit, you would get uh, 666 um, tons launch weight, now this isn't its real launch weight. Its real launch weight is about 600 tons. And the reason why it's not 660 is because its upper stage is actually a Hydrolox engine, it's the J2. So it's actually shading a little bit more to Hydrolox there. And so it cuts down on the launch mass. But you'll note that the J2 stage tank is nearly as big as the first stage tank here because of the low density of the Hydrolox, of the hydrogen in particular. Okay, so let's go through our, and uh, I wanted the M1. M1 uh, is expensive and wasn't really used even though it was developed, and but it has a special place in that um, it goes all the way down here on this side. So we have to have it. Okay, so up here is class one. Class one are your probe engines. These are all hypergolic. These will store the fuels so that they don't boil off. That's important in realism overhaul. The fuels can boil off. Though these days you have MLI layers. Oh, that's a mess because I've got all these engines on. Um, yeah, clicking on, uh, do not have this many different kinds of engines on your tanks. But uh, on the regular old tanks, you have MLI layers, which is insulation, so that you can prevent boil off. So boil off is not that big a deal anymore. But uh, still, you might want to take into consideration, in that case, the probe engine should be hypergolics. Your basic engine, uh, and the most important engine in the game, is the one kilonewton thruster. You'll see feed pressure is too low, that means it needs a pressurized tank and uh, you'll have to check whether a tank is pressurized or not, or if you're using um, procedural parts, you can select a service module tank for that, or uh, these days uh, it might be called a high pressure tank. Uh, but yeah, the one kilonewton thruster has options. A lot of these engines have an engine 
UI and it'll let you sec select different versions. And the optimal version is either Erizine or UDMH and N204. These two are the best hypergolic fuels. MH and MON3 is possible. The important thing is that you configure your RCS thrusters, hopefully to the same fuel that you're using for the, your engines here. And sometimes it'll be Erizine, sometimes it'll be UDMH, sometimes it'll be MMH. Um, the important thing is to match them so that you don't have to pack two different, few, uh, two different uh, sets of propellants. Uh, this is just a two kilonewton thruster. This here is the advanced Gemini lander engine from FASA. It's a bit controversial uh, because it is so good. And, but it is definitely a mainline engine, meaning that if you have it, you would want to use it because it has throttling, it has infinite ignitions, and it's pretty efficient in terms of space uh, with its 11 kilonewtons. So, and it's fairly affordable. So it's a very good lander engine. Uh, and so I find a lot of use for it, but it probably ought to be a little bit bigger than it is. And uh, yeah, a lot of these are basically glorified RCS thrusters and having infinite ignitions is a key feature. So yeah, or just a lot of ignitions. Some of the other engines that we have here that you'll get less use of is this Estes series engine. Uh, it's about 30 kilonewtons and uh, it has an Estes 2 version that's a, uh, much more uh, efficient than a lot of the engines over here. In fact, that probably is more efficient than it ought to be. But anyway, 20 ignitions is pretty good. Um, the Astris engine is another one, uh, pressure-fed infinite ignitions, not as efficient as the Estes engine, but infinite ignitions is a good deal. Uh, there's also this little guy. This is the DU-802 rocket engine. This is from Raider Nick's Soviet, uh, Soviet rockets, and this is used on the Dnieper rocket. 10 ignitions and uh, just 4 kilonewtons, so it's more like one of the little thrusters here. These just uh, come with realism overall, so you don't need a special pack for those. Um, next step up in thrust, uh, AJ-10-190, uh, though actually that's comparable to the Estes engine. You note 500 ignitions, um, not quite as efficient as the Estes engine, but the 500 ignitions are nice, and this is sort of a mainstay engine altogether uh, because of its use on the space shuttle as its OMS engine, and also on Orion that's coming up. So uh, it really will continue to be used for the foreseeable future. Uh, it's extremely reliable. Uh, other famous engines in a similar class, though with fewer ignitions, and that's why I put it off to the side here. Um, the Lunar Module Ascent Engine, 10 ignitions. Um, that does not throttle. The Lunar Module Descent Engine, and that has only three ignitions, but it does throttle. And so these were, of course, used on the Apollo landing missions. Um, interesting engines from the Soviets uh, and now the Russians. The S5, the 9-2 engine is, I, I think actually uh, this is post-Soviet. But uh, it has very nice efficiency, uh, about the same thrust actually, a little bit less thrust than the AJ-10-190, so it should be up there somewhere. But 50 ignitions make it really attractive, uh, and it's probably cheaper than the AJ-10-190. So more like up here-ish. We can move that down. And this is another variant that's more efficient, but with fewer ignitions, the S5.8. 98M. So if you're running Soviet engines, these two are probably the ones you will use instead of the AJ-10-190 or even instead of these two engines. But they, these do not throttle. Uh, one that you can use that may throttle is the engine on the N-1 moon lander and that is the RD-858 with 12 ignitions and um, it, it has a 27% minimum throttle and good efficiency, UDMH and N204. So again, all these are hypergolic, uh, Arizona N204 or UDMH and N204 or MMH and MON3 are typically the fuels you'll get here. And then uh, there's the service module engine from Apollo, which is much larger than them. It's like 90 kilonewtons and 50 ignitions, but it's sort of in the same class. So this is all class one. And But you can see it's really big, so you really only want to put it on the service module. It is the engine down there. Okay, class two. Uh, class two are our transfer engines. 
they're generally used not for the probe, uh, not for making orbit around a planet or something like that, unless it's the moon, um, but generally for transfers out to planets. And so the first is the S1.5, I just call it the RD58. The RD58 comes in a lot of flavors and increasing um, efficiency and increasing ignitions as well. It starts off with five and ends up with 15. And, but it is much more efficient than any of these up here. And that's because it uses kerosene and oxygen. So it has the benefit of many ignitions and also high efficiency. Uh, but the oxygen may boil off depending on your tank. Uh, another option in the same class as the RD58, about 60 kilonewtons, is the Gina engine. This one will not have fuel that boils off. It's not as efficient as the RD58, but it will have storable fuels. And later on, you get this variant, the model 8096L, which has 15 ignitions. The earlier ones only have one or two. So uh, this one also has 15 ignitions, the uh, BA-13. So still we're sort of in the range of many ignitions over here. And the KVD, this is a uh, Russian designed engine. And I think this is actually the Vernier. You can see two engine uh, things here. That's because one set is the, the Verniers on it. Uh, KVD and then CE-7.5 is when it got imported into India and used on their rockets. Uh, so about 60, 70 kilonewtons, but extreme efficiency because this is now a Hydrolox engine. And the same is true of the other mainstays right here under it, the RL-10, the RD-0146, and the RL-10B2 with the really big nozzle. Uh, but generally, you might want to use the KVD if you can fit it on your stage. It does have this weird mount on it, thanks to the verniers, and so that makes it, well, they actually put the verniers on the nozzle on this particular model, so I don't know why they put them out. But anyway, it's much cheaper than any of these. So you might want to go with that if you're in career mode, if you can unlock that. But all of these are Hydrolox engines with more than 440 seconds of ISP, and they're all in the same class and interchangeable functionally. So are these to some extent, the LE5 from Japan and the GSLV Mark III CE20 from India. So. Next step up, uh, call it, so this is uh, class two. This is class three now. And class three, you get larger engines, um, more in the hundreds of kilonewton range, still potentially transfer engines, but more often used as upper stages. And uh, the first one you're likely to get is the LR-105, or if you're playing with Soviet engines, RD-0110 or Z-105 or Z-109, which are precursors to it. And uh, they come around 300 kilonewtons. They use kerosene and oxygen and get about 330 seconds ISP. And then ultimately, uh, these get outclassed by the RD0124, which gets 350 seconds of ISP. So the RD0124 is the mainline upper stage engine in this class. And then there are other options like the RD119, uh, which is a little bit peculiar uh, from the Cosmos 2 rocket. And then a step up in thrust, uh, you get the RD-120 from the Zenit rocket, and uh, a possible option is the BE-3U, especially if you have the vacuum variant of this available. I don't believe I have it right now. And the RD-0210 from the Proton rocket, but uh, those are ancillary options. Uh, other things, NK-9V and NK-9. Those are about 400 kilonewtons. All of these are like 300, 400, 500 kilonewtons. Um, this one can be used as a first stage engine as well. So can the BE-3. Um, the rest of these are still upper stage engines, but not like class two, which is pure transfer engines, really ought not to be used as upper stages unless you want to wait a while. Uh, down here, we'll call this class four. These can be used as first stage engines and they come in all sorts. And this is where the Merlin engine comes in, 1,000 kilonewtons. These are all around the 1,000 kilonewton range, 800 to 1,000-ish. The Merlin 1D, uh, obviously very nice because of the small space it takes up. 
and the nice thrust it provides. It is, uh, in a way, a development on the H1. It's sort of in the same area. It's a kerosene oxygen engine uh, taking up very little space and easily clusterable. And of course, the H1 engine is the one that we have eight of at the bottom of the Saturn One rocket. Uh, similar, basically, in scope as the Falcon 9, as far as payload to orbit. Uh, Falcon 9 is sort of a trimmer, uh, <laughs> a Saturn One rocket. Uh, but um, earlier engines might be the LRA9 or LR79. LR79 isn't really not that great. LR89 is the booster engine on the Atlas rocket. It's usually paired with the core engine on the Atlas rocket, the sustainer engine, the LR105, and that makes for a nice combination. Uh, Hydrolox options are over here, and these are highly efficient, but again, big tanks and usually more expensive. Uh, LR87, the Hydrolox version, and the LE7, that's the core engine on the Japanese H2 rocket, and then the Vulcane engine, which is the core engine on Ariane 5. But basically, I'd pick the J2 every time. And the J2 has three ignitions. It could be used as the lower stage engine if you use SRBs with it because you do not want to ignite it on the ground. Unlike, that's the one exception. These can be ignited on the ground. The LR87 Hydrolox Edition, the LE7, and the Vulcane, these can be lit on the ground. This one, you would want to light the boosters, and in Realism Overhaul, the boosters can gimbal. You have to check that. Um, you can just light SRBs, and then light this at about 10 kilometers, and you'll be fine. And it has really good uh, ISP, three, uh, 436, and nice thrust, and it's fairly cheap. In fact, uh, one of these, depending on which variant of the RL-10 you have, uh, this engine could be cheaper than it. So... If, if you're playing in career mode, RP1. So yeah, that's an option for a nice Hydrolox. But if you have these engines, you could use those as the sea level. Then then just use this as the transfer stage as it is being used on the Saturn 1. It is the engine on the second stage here. So that is basically class 4, the 1000 kilonewton range uh, possible first stage engines. Then we get into the pure first stage engines. Uh, you could use some of these as upper stage, like the NK-15V with its big nozzle, instead of the NK-15. These are the same engine, just one with a bigger nozzle. Um, so this is an upper stage engine. But a lot of the time, you'll still use it as your first stage engine, because even though it has less efficiency at sea level, 260, uh, you don't stay at sea level for very long. And with real solar system, the world is big, and most of the time you're trying to get to orbit, you are in near vacuum or vacuum. So yeah, you can pretty much make use of that right from the start if you need to, if you can fit enough of them on your stage. So NK15, NK15V are 1,500 kilonewton, and I should put this a little bit closer to them. This is the Proton engine, the RD253, and uh, you can see why it might be a uh, better engine than these. It's trimmer, it's easier to cluster, as it is at the bottom of the Proton rocket. And uh, these were the engines from the N1 rocket. Uh, they, they clustered them, but I don't think it worked very well. Um, next up, RD191, 2,000 kilonewtons. Uh, uh, this one, this one, this one, uh, this one is a hypergolic one, but uh, th these are mostly kerosene and oxygen engines altogether. Um, this is probably uh, the RD, sorry, the RD-253 here is one of the hypergolics. And then the other hypergolic to speak of is the RD-270, which is really big. It's 6,000 kilonewtons. A lot of these, though, are kerosene oxygen engines, except for on this side, we have the main engines of Energia and the space shuttle. And these are uh, Hydrolox. And then the main engine on the Delta IV rocket, the RS-68, which is also Hydrolox. Uh, the problem with using Hydrolox engines as your first stage, you do need to use SRBs um, to complement them. Uh, and they are very expensive. So, and uh, I, I do wonder with the, S, uh, the Delta IV, uh, how it would work out if you put the Titan IV engines on the side of it. Uh, Titan IV SRBs, sorry. 
uh, Titan IV SRBs on the side of it instead of uh, the Delta IV Heavy uh, arrangement. Uh, here in the middle of everything are uh, the newcomers, the oddballs, the, the Raptor methane oxygen engines. And they'll be mainstays uh, once they are in service. They're really good engines. So yeah, if you have real engine pack, they are options. But here is the engine on the Atlas V, the RD-180. That's 4,000 kilonewtons. And finally, our super big engines, the RD-270 hypergolic the methane oxygen RD-170, the F1 engine from the Saturn V rocket, and the M1 engine from nothing in particular, but uh, it is the, it's basically the hydrogen oxygen version of the F1, so it's very efficient and can be used at sea level. Uh, so basically it's the bigger brother of all these. So when designing a rocket, of course, I'll think about how big a rocket I want. And if I'm not building a rocket that needs to be 700 tons, there's no reason for me to be using any of these engines down here. Um, really, for the most part, uh, sticking to 1000 kilonewtons, these engines get a lot of work when I'm designing rockets and maybe trickling out to here. But I would rarely use any of these. Uh, because they require a fairly large rocket to make them efficient. And oftentimes, uh, especially with the hypergol uh, I, sorry, the Hydrolox ones, they need SRBs to really make them worthwhile with their pricing. Uh, but yeah, these right here, plus maybe these as upper stage engines, plus these as transfer engines, and then these as the probe engines, basically sums up the whole business. And so if I was going to make a rocket with any engine uh, I could, um, it depends on the size of the rocket, but RD-253 is a pretty attractive first stage engine if I want a heavier rocket or Merlin 1D, of course. And if a super heavy rocket, maybe the Raptor engines here. So the J2 is really, sorry, the J2 here is uh, one that, I, I like to pair with SRBs if I want to go there. Or, because they're so trim and cheap, the H1 engines. I don't know if the H1 engines in RP-1 are cheaper than the Merlin 1s, I'll have to see, but they might be. And so clustering a bunch of those and turning them into booster engines for a J2 uh, core could work out. Uh, and then, beyond that, uh, I like the RD-120, I like the RD-0124. And then uh, these hydrogen oxygen engines, probably I just stick to the KVD if I can fit it. Often I'll use the RD58 and you'll see that in my RP1 series. That's a very common engine for me to use. And then the AJ10190, the little S5.92 style engines, the lunar Gemini lander engine, and then one or two kilonewton thrusters. So just down the middle here, are the engines that I use the most by far. Um, I'll throw in an F1 just to mix things up. And for a super, super, super big rocket, maybe an M1, but it has to be really big to justify an M1. Um, we're talking about more than 3,000 tons, more than Saturn V level. You can start contemplating that. But basically, that's the idea. So if you have any questions, of course, I haven't covered all the engines. I just covered some of them, but enough of them, I think. And if you have any questions about a particular engine, or you want to dispute something, or uh, you have a question, any question, just uh, leave them in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please do press like, and I'll see you next time.